the 18 alleged co-conspirators, mostly his attorneys like Jenna Ellis, Rudy Giuliani, and John Eastman, who was the intellectual architect of that elector scheme that Mike Pence rejected. Um, it's a scheme that was laid out in this six-point memo that was released. Um, I've highlighted a couple sections of this, including one aspect is that Pence would gavel in Trump uh, as reelected after um, kind of rejecting one slate of electors for another and then force the other side to fight to to fight to fight it out in court. So going on a, a sort of offense and point six here, he says the main thing here is that Pence should do this without asking for permission, either from a vote of the joint session or from the court. Let the other side challenge his actions in court. Eastman recently appeared, he appeared last week on Laura Ingram's show on Fox, and this is what he had to say in his defense. You know, the people that I was representing had a right to counsel. And what's going on here with the bar complaints against everybody involved in any of the litigation, this Fulton County complaint, the unindicted co-conspirators in the federal action, they're trying to stifle people from being able to get representation in election challenges. If, if disputed questions of constitutional law all of a sudden become criminal, we, we could, we could uh, throw you know, the entire legal profession, the entire legal academy in, in jail. Now, the fact of the matter is throughout our history, uh, significant uh, leaders in Congress have, have argued that Congress doesn't have authority under the 12th Amendment, that the founders specifically designed it that way so that the president wouldn't owe his job to Congress. It's a core separation of powers principle that the founders adopted, and he just doesn't, he ignores that uh, in his analysis. So the notion that this is well settled is crazy. Is bringing the attorneys into this case, criminalizing dissent and criminalizing the uh, a profession of law, as Eastman suggests here, Ilya? In a word, no, uh, because what Eastman and some of the others were doing here went beyond simply giving legal advice. It was participating and urging a scheme of illegal conduct. In this case, as he's highlighted in that memo, trying to get Pence to illegally reject the electoral votes uh, and the like. And there's many cases involving mafia lawyers, for example, where when the lawyer doesn't merely advise his client and sort of how to defend himself in court or something like that, but instead, uh, you know, participates in a scheme for, for illegal action, you know, lawyers can be prosecuted for that. And this is far from the first time uh, that this has happened. To be sure, there can be cases where there's gray areas, as with many legal doctrines. In this case, with Eastman and some of the others, I don't think it's that much of a gray area because Eastman was clearly urging the specific plan uh, that was uh, adopted here. Uh, he wasn't mere, even merely saying like, you know, somebody else wanted to do the plan and they asked Eastman whether it would be legal or not. Uh, you know, Eastman went beyond, you know, something uh, like that. So uh, if, uh, you know, a mafia lawyer advises uh, his, you know, his mafia client that, you know, you know, we should we should kill this person. And not only that, but it would be legal to kill him because it would just be self-defense or something like that. Uh, you know, the mafia lawyer could be prosecuted for that and he couldn't hide behind, you know, the idea that he was just giving legal advice uh, that, that you know, the planning of future crimes uh, is one of the uh, standard exceptions to attorney client privilege and one of the kinds of things that historically lawyers can be and have been prosecuted for when they engage in it. Okay, but isn't that kind of an extreme metaphor? You know, he he wasn't uh, uh, advocating anyone be killed. He his argument is that this is a legitimate uh, contested area of constitutional interpretation. You you just agree. You just disagree that this is in any way a valid way to interpret the Constitution. So his argument was extremely bad, but uh, this is going beyond merely making a bad argument in the abstract. This is urging a specific course of action and planning it out. Uh, uh, and uh, I don't think it's at the comparisons to mafia is all that extreme when you recognize the dire, horrible consequences of what would have happened if this scheme had succeeded. That is that a president would have been able to stay in power despite losing an election. Uh, that's 
you know, not exactly the same thing as, as carrying out a murder, uh, but it's nonetheless a large scale awful crime. One of the things that worries me a little bit about the sort of seditious, seditious conspiracy wrapper around this is how far that can be extended. I mean, we're already we're roping in attorneys who are advancing these legal theories or courses of action. Um, you know, the, the sedition charge has been used to prosecute and sentence to decades in prison. Actually, no, there is no sedition charge in any of these cases. Okay. There's a, cons but it, okay. So there's a conspiracy charge. There's a, there's a, the sure. Rico charge. Okay. And then we can say that, you, you know, the sedition charge is a separate charge that's been uh, applied to the, the January 6 rioters um, who are now, some of them are facing decades in prison, so, some who were not even there. I, I'm, I'm worried that this approach, this expansive approach is handing unbounded power to suppress dissent to whichever party controls the state. Should I be worried about that? Uh, I think in this particular set of cases, no. Uh, when you talk about the January 6th people, yes, some of them weren't there, but those who weren't there were ones who were involved in the planning of the attack on the Capitol. They weren't merely people who just said the election was illegitimate or that Trump really won and the like. They were leaders of organizations like the Oath Keepers and the Proud Boys who were directly involved in the planning of the attack. So if you're involved in the planning of a violent action, uh, you can certainly be charged with that, uh, even if you weren't personally present there. Uh, and uh, on the, uh, the breadth of a conspiracy, you know, as I said before, I'm not an expert on RICO, uh, but uh, I, when you're looking at people like Eastman, these were people who are in the inner circle of planners, specifically planning out the specific actions regarding fake electors, uh, rejecting the, uh, you know, the, the plan to have Trump reject the ballots and uh, reject the electoral votes and so forth. So these are not people with some far out indirect connection to the plan. These were essentially the planners themselves. Uh, in the Georgia case, admittedly, I'm not, in, uh, I'm not familiar with all the details of all the indictments of the 18 different people. So perhaps you can find someone among the 18 was much further removed than Eastman. And if so, we can talk about whether, you know, it's a good idea to charge that person or not. But with someone like Eastman and other uh, people closely involved in the planning, I think, you know, there's no great slippery slope risk. Indeed, there's a slippery slope risk the other way. If you let pe these people get off simply because they're lawyers or the like, uh, because then that creates an obvious incentive to use lawyers to uh, plan your uh, schemes to uh, stay in power. Hey, thanks for watching that clip from our conversation with Ilya Soman about the Trump indictments. For another clip, go right here. For the full conversation, click here.